Hi everybody, my name is Danica Joan and welcome to another edition of Custody Matters Live. I have an amazing guest with me today. It's Dr. Rita Fierro and she has a book. Actually, she's a, um, a social scientist. I guess I'm going to let her know, give me, tell me what her official uh, title is because there's just such an amazing um, amount of conversations. We could go into 10 different directions in regards to her. I know that she has a book where that's called Give, Give Me Back My Child, and it deals with how the, the system, the U.S. system, kidnaps ch children um, in the foster system in particular, but of course it also has to do with our familiarity with the family court system. Um, so we will have, who knows where this conversation is going to be going. Welcome, Rita. Thank you for having me, Danica. I've, um, yeah, you know, when we talked last week, we really, there were so many different angles. I was like, oh my gosh, we have enough to fill several shows in regards to this, because I know that you're doing work that has to do with um, the, the current state of dealing with um, racial conflict. You're also working, uh, you have some, some different projects going. And of course, this particular week happens to be leading into Father's Day, which all of these are family relationship dynamics. So um, where, would, where would you like to start the conversation, I guess? Sure. So I'll, I'll, uh, I think first I'd like to say what a social scientist does, because that's not, like, a lot of people don't think about social scientists as a profession. Um, so I'm a sociologist, which is one form of social scientist. And basically what we do is look at patterns. Like, we look at patterns in history and society, and we make meaning from those patterns. So if you think about how a scientist uh, discovers, um, physical laws by looking at patterns and how physical things behave. Um, what social scientists do is pay attention to uh, social laws by paying attention to how societies shift and change or don't shift at all. Um, yeah, so that's, so I've been like trained as a sociologist and I have a PhD in African American studies. And so my focus for the past 25 years has been looking at structures of inequality and really doing deep studies around how uh, systems of inequality are shaped by our culture, by our personal outlook on life, by the way we see the world, but also by these systems that were built at specific moments in time. And that as much as we think the systems change, they actually tend to always reinforce themselves. And so um, I acknowledge you for your passion for bringing like peace and unity and healing to families. Um, because we currently operate, I would say, in a system that I was just telling you before feeds the pain. Our mm -hmm. systems don't actually feed healing, they feed pain. Yeah, feeds the pain. That's like, a, that is something I'm sure that resonates with a lot of our viewers is, uh, this is, this is a system that you get into and then you're traumatized and, um, through the process of it. And sometimes it works out for you, but even if it works out for you, um, you still, you've got this trauma to deal with uh, in that process. And, you know, one of the things that I saw, like the common um, denominator in working with you or, or speaking with you is there's so many things that are related, whether it's working in the foster system and the trauma that parents uh, incur in dealing, you know, finding their children uh, being taken away from them or, um, you know, or it's in the family court system, or if it's in the black community, all of this is there are certain ways that um, there are so, certain injustices that have happened to each one of us. And there's a whole community that just seems completely unaware that um, of our plight. Yeah. Well, I think, so, this is this is why like I'm so passionate about systems and like writing um, another book, something that I'll probably publish online really shortly um, about the origin of the systems. Because what systems feed themselves on is us forgetting the seed, right? It's like you plant an apple tree from an apple seed, and then you get surprised that the app it's an apple tree. 
Like, mm -hmm. why are we surprised? So custody, so family law, right, is a system that was created to protect the rights of white men over white women and, and white children. That's what that body of law was created to do. Say that again. So family court system was designed. Yeah. And I'm not talking about dependency court, which is like the foster care system, all that. That was that had a different intention. Okay. But family law as a body of law was created to protect the rights of white men, right, in the face of white women and white children, which also means to control white women and white children. Wow. Like that's why that body of law was created, because women didn't have equal rights when the family court system was created. When family law was created, women didn't even have a right to vote. Only white men had a right to vote. So of course, they shaped the seed of that system. The seed that was planted was the protection of the rights of white men over women and children. Ah, but, yeah, and you know, that's, that's like a huge trigger for <laughs> probably a lot of our dads on the show. Yeah. You know, they're watching the show because they're like, but I, I had to fight just to ha be, have the right to be a dad in the family court system. Yeah, well, and that's because, yes, yes. There are plenty of dads who are like fighting as hard as women are fighting. Um, and there, there are a couple of things I wanna say about that. So first is, um, so in sociology, there's a distinction between sex and gender, right? So sex is the physical biology gender is the interpretation that we make around biology, right? So mm -hmm. sex is, you know, a vagina versus a penis versus like intersex, right? Gender is the roles we take on. Mm -hmm. So nurturing children is a feminine gendered role. And so the law refers to it and treats it like it treats women, regardless of whether you're a man or a woman. So I would argue that a father fighting for full custody is still bumping against the systemic structures meant to control women, even if he's a man. Because mm -hmm. again, it doesn't become an orange tree just because you're a man. It's still an apple tree. Interesting. And I, um... there's a huge, I'll just add this, like there's a huge body of law which is gender and the law, which if you learn, like there are many scholars in legal studies who have studied how implicit biases against women have been embedded in our bodies of law. Like I didn't make this up. I studied it, but I didn't make it up. Interesting. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a few people, somebody I had on the show previously, who's also a social scientist, a uh, sociology professor, um, and she, she did a TED talk where she basically stripped the gender out of the dynamics of mom and dad so that you could really see how it is that, that there are these gender biases, yeah. um, in society. Yeah. And so, and so one of the things I, I wanted to just share with you a quote from a, family court um, judge that I interviewed for my work, for my book, um, if it's helpful. And then we can go in a different direction if you want. Um, so I interviewed, so my work has been on the, uh, the, the stories of mothers who lost their children to foster care. And we're really, really fighting hard to get them back. Um, so it sounds like kind of somewhat similarly traumatic experiences, but having those experience with the state instead of your partner. So that's kind of the difference of our bodies of work. Your focus is when people are fighting their partner and how the state contributes to that because of the body of laws. Mine is actually like families who are predominantly poor trying to fight against a system, a state, uh, arm wrestling with the state to get their kids back. And it's, it's a very hard thing to do, uh, not because they've done horrific things to their children, but because most of the times um, the state that sets the standards sets the standards according to middle class values and in the face of what it looks like to be poor in America, 
um, rarely do, can they win that arm wrestle. Um, so uh, I just wanted to offer the example. I have a one of the uh, lawyers and prior family court judges I interviewed um, said to me that uh, although she had been a lawyer in criminal court on death sentence cases, so she was defending death sentence clients, um, she basically uh, wanted to become a judge and she got moved from criminal court to family court because she was a woman. And when she was, and she was in this case, she was on the dependency court side, not on the custody court side, which is the work that you do. And, um, and what she said was that it wasn't court at all because there was no evidence, like the state brings evidence, there is no evidence promoted on the part of the parent. And that actually what it is, is a group of middle-class professionals choosing about their comfort level and how this woman parents. Yes. Yes. And so the very fact that that pat and she said it's not court. She basically said I had to leave that. Which I only was in that position for a year because I vowed to go by the law, and that was in court because there was no evidence I was I was expected to sentence on. And I'm I'm offering that up because although it's different from custody law, the very fact that the standard of evidence is so low, and we can talk about that a, a lot more the standard of evidence is lower than criminal court because it's seen as the area of women, of women. Mm. Because in criminal court, you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. In family court and custody court, you don't have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. No, you just have to have enough innuendo or you get a highly paid uh, lawyer that can fight really hard uh, for that innuendo and then you you uh and it's like a winner takes all kind of court yeah and because of that that's why on the abuse cases um many kind of rich or um kind of middle and upper class like abuse is underdiagnosed in white middle class and upper class families because they can afford that lawyer mm. and in your on your case right on the custody side it's just whoever can afford the like either feistiest lawyer or most expensive lawyer, most experienced lawyer. Yeah, you know, this is the thing, like in court, a lot of times what prolongs the case, which, you know, further traumatizes the family unit by is the constant continuances. And it's, yeah, sometimes it's a tactic of the attorneys, but a lot of times I've, I've found, even in personal experience, the judges are not willing to, to, to make a decision. So the best thing to do is to continue it because they know that their time is just about to run out and then it won't be their problem anymore. It'll be the next judge's problem. So Peggy Cooper Davis, who um, is a person who has written extensively on the bias of dependency law, has an article on what she calls the status quo bias. And she analyzed a number of court cases and said that basically as an entity, and this is again going back to protecting the rights of kind of rich white men, right? Court structure as an entity favors the status quo. So if a child has already been removed, the chances of the court legislating against that is a lot harder than them just keeping it the same. Yes. And again, I, she's a lawyer to that. The legal article. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge tactic. If you can just delay, 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 if you can get temporary custody um, and then stretch out the, um, you know, the divorce, everything like that, if you just stretch it out, then the, then the judge is not going to uh, change the circumstances of the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's what I meant about, like, what I'm really, of course, personal experiences vary, and I can't speak for every person's personal experience, and there's often a personal experience that feels like an exception to that overarching rule. But what I'm passionate about is having people actually see those overarching pressures, because those get only changed through movement building. Like no individual case can shift a, system, a legal system. It takes a movement to shift a legal system. And the kind of movement building that we're seeing now is the kind of movement building it takes to 
to actually shift systems and systems feed themselves by being transparent, by being invisible, right? Mm. So unless you're a lawyer, you don't quite think about why does my, why is it that when I go to court, it looks a lot different than what it looks like on TV? Why is that? Because a lot of us think that when we go to court, it's going to be like on TV, right? That our lawyer is going to go to bat for us and the truth will come alive, right? And then we have all our high Hollywood picture of what it means to go to court. And then we go to court and oftentimes the person who's directly affected can't speak or very little. They're dependent on the lawyer to say what they hope is right. Oftentimes there's language used that they don't understand. Like why, why is it like that? And again, it's in yeah. part because the standard of evidence is lower for family matters because a parent uh, embedded in our system, there's the concept that losing your freedom is a more important um, right than losing your children. You know, I, I've seen that personally because, you know, I've done, I've been brought in and as an expert witness and I've left so frustrated and so disempowered because you, it's, it's the chess game. It's the rules of engagement that the attorneys use. They, oh, nope, you can't use that. You can't do that. And then they're basically gagging you along the way. So you really couldn't come to share what you know. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's the same thing. And I really encourage my clients to, to try to don't, if you think that the judge is going to, you're going to win because the judge is going to hear you and is going to um, hear the truth and, you know, and be your hero and stuff like that, you're going to walk away very disappointed that um, uh, in that situation. And, um, and I really encourage people to go to really take mediation seriously because pretty much all of the courts now go through a mediation process so that, so that the client, the individual can have a little bit of, you know, be in charge of this, of the outcome. Yeah. But, um, but it's not necessarily the case when you're dealing with a high conflict custody situation where there's multiple uh, allegations of, of abuse and neglect. And then, you know, uh, and then the children are enrolled in this conversation with the parent who's targeting. I mean, it's just, it gets to be like a real crazy, like uh, just not nightmare. And a lot of, um, and if you're the one that's being targeted, it's just, now you're in survival mode and emotion. And you know how that goes that when you're in survival and you're driven by emotion, if you don't have, um, you're like, you can't even see straight. So, yeah. um, I would say that our systems actually foster the survival mode. Like they're, they actually, from my like 25 years of trying to like really understand systemic racism, um, I think the, our systems actually poke and prod and do everything they can to put us in survival mode because we're easier to control when we're reacting. Yeah. And, um, and I think there's just, there's a trauma reenactment there. And I don't know that the system, I don't think the system was, began to intentional reenact trauma. I think the people who started the system were traumatized and embedded it in all of our practices without even knowing they were. Um, but if you look at like outside of a mediator whose sole goal is to have you not go to the fight, right? Everyone else gets paid for you to fight. Wow. Every, everyone else gets paid for you to fight. And, and I think, and I often think about, which is, I mean, part of why I'm so passionate about systems, right? Is because almost all of our systems make money over the pain and the suffering. Yeah. So how do we stop the pain and the suffering when it's the backbone of our economic system? 
right? Like we have to be willing to, and I'm not saying that to like create the usual type of like hopelessness of like, oh my God, we have no power. Let's go eat chocolate cake, right? Like not that, no, not that. I'm saying like what it's going to take along with fighting the fight and self-care, which I'll get to in a second, especially for your audience, right? But like along with the short-term self-care, doing everything you can to take care of yourself, to not be in reaction mode, to not go into survival, right? Doing whatever healing work it takes, and it takes a lot to not get triggered. I, I, I don't have children, but from everything I, I, for the little I know, like I, I think it must take like every cell in your body to not react when your children are on the line and when your life is on the line, right? Um, so I have like a lot of them of compassion for it, even having not experienced it myself. Um, but it takes, I think along with that short term work, what I would love to see and like where I'm committed to in my work is how do we build like a movement that is society wide where we can actually reimagine a society with an economic structure that actually earns money off of healing. Oh, wow. That would be what so would great. Like? Yeah. What would it look like to have a healthcare system that makes money off of health? What would it look like to have an education system that makes money off of people actually being more educated and more critical thinkers and more like that the more, the, the more healed we are and the more empowered we are and the more alive we are, the more money there is to be made, like the more prosperous we are, as opposed to the more we create war, the more we make weapons, the more people die, the more some people get rich, because that's what we do now. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, that's the thing is it's survival. It is combative. It's not, uh, oh my God. Yeah. And a lot of times people, they don't, they like to keep it status quo. They don't want like all of this, this Black Lives Matter. Um, a lot of what people are being triggered by is like, whoa, we just wanted it to be like, keep it dormant, keep it dormant, because then we have, we don't have to acknowledge that there's a problem. And, um, and fighting is not the answer. Having these riots is not the answer. Um, the answer is, you know, let's just define workability and um, create some possibility together. And, and yet it's not always possible when you're, when you're dealing with your opponent because both sides are still mad or at least one side is still mad and ready to, you know, to battle. Yeah. So. So I want to say a couple of things about that because I think I may be on a slightly different front than you. So mm -hmm. one, um, one, I want to say that um, blindness is the backbone of white, of white, white supremacy and white superiority, right? Like I often call it the white picket fence and not in my backyard. Um, a very common expression, not in my neighborhood. To me, like when people move to the suburbs and then, you know, they're pretty much like, I, I don't care about that. That's happening over there in the city. Like, I, right? And when it starts going closer to the buyer backyard, then people get activated because it's like not in my neighborhood. And to me, that's like the backbone of how white folk keep our privilege. Um, because as long as we don't see right? As long as it doesn't affect us, as, as long as we don't see, then we can live in the fiction that everything's okay. And everything being okay is, is the life we're trying to preserve, right? Everything's okay. We live in the best country in the world. America is perfect. America the best. And I'm the best for being American. Like we actually believe as white folk, like someone who's born and raised in the U.S. I had, I left for 15 years and came back, but like, I believed that as a white girl, white little girl born in America, right? In New York City, in New York City of all places, right? So it was pretty diverse. Um, and uh, when you say uh, the riots aren't the answer, um, I would like to say two things. One that the, the, first of all, I like to call them not riots, but rebellion and revolts. Because just like in the 60s, riots gives you the sense that people are just going crazy. Like, right? It's just like people are just going mad, um, which doesn't actually reflect it 
So I live in a black neighborhood in Philadelphia and black owned businesses were not impacted by looting. What were impacted by looting were the huge multinational corporations like the, the Rite Aids and the CDSs and that take money out of the black community and invest it on the stock market and make more money and make more money, but they don't really reinvest in the community where we live. Mm. And so there's, there, there is sometimes a, um, so there's a mindfulness in revolt, rebellion, uprising that we often dismiss when we call things riots. Yes. Um, you know, it certainly gets your attention and it's not something, uh, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't serve me or anyone else to say, oh, they're wrong um, and all that. Like, that's just their way of, like, I, this is the only way I could get your attention. Now let's talk about what it is I'm angry about. Yeah, so for me, it's, as a white person, I don't, I don't go around saying riots are not the answer. Okay. Um, because I think listening is the answer. <laughs> And um, when things escalate, it's because folks haven't been listening. Got like it. I think the person who, even the person who tags, you know, tags is like black spray painting. Um, they they've been screaming before. Mm. They just weren't heard. And the other thing I want to add is that um, what adds to the complexity of this is that the match on the keg was actually placed by white supremacy groups. So I have many friends in Minneapolis who have been occupied by uh, white supremacists that are the ones who actually started the looting. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that there's a, there's a keg of tension, racial tension that we carry around and they actually sparked it. So part of like what brings the complexity to, and there are lots of videos online of like basically white people like um, breaking windows. And so in my, a lot of what I've seen, and I've noticed a little bit of this in Philadelphia downtown as well, is that the person breaking the window was not the same person that was going in to say, oh, the window's broken. I'll, I'll go get something. And I, you know, I saw homeless people, people who looked homeless to me kind of go in and get a bunch of bags. And I was like, okay, I got it. You're, you're going to sell those tomorrow and you have your income for the month. So I think there, there's a lot more complexity to this. Than, than often meets the eye. And I know that's not quite on our topic, but I, I just had to be there to be an integrity no, and my stand I'm, in the world. I mean, I'm here trying to see what it's like, you know, get a different perspective because I get that there's a lot of things that I, viewpoints that come out of my mouth and that, you know, that it takes someone to say, hey, did you think of, did you see it this way? Yeah. And I'm like, ah. Yeah, I mean, that's why well, I, I tend to not use the expression like riots don't work because I don't think it's for me in the comfort of my own home to yeah. say how someone who's had enough yeah. has to be hurt. Like, I don't think it's for me to say. Good and point. that doesn't mean I'm like, I'm not, you know, pro burning it all down and I'm not pro piecing it up, patching it all up. But I, I think, you know, people have the right to just, you know, I don't want to be controlled in, in what comes out of my mouth, right? Even in this call, right? That I'm like veering off a little bit, right? Um, like, I think, I think people who have had enough mm -hmm. um, get to say how. It's just what's been really problematic here is that there, there's been a intentional lighting of the keg and then a scapegoating of, of, of black folk. And that, that's, I, I, I think we need to be really careful because the picture is a lot more complex than many people are giving. Um, it's picture. such a, like I said in the very beginning of our, um, of this is it's, there's so many, our conversation could go 20 different ways because it's not a simple solution. Yeah. Um, and it's systemic. It is the, to the family court system, uh, has similar re things that have it broken just as just as dependency court system, just as society. Yeah. Um, anytime there's an us versus them, you know, there's going, you know, there is some common, um, common themes that, uh, and there's no easy answer. So yeah, and and it is that piece around, right? How do we envision systems that are actually grounded in human healing and, and the sacredness of every human life. 
right? Like yeah. if we had that system, most of your followers wouldn't be like getting ulcers out of experiences in family court and we probably wouldn't have riots either, or rebellions mm -hmm. either. So we've got about like a minute and a half before we need to end the show. I have, I know you have some things coming up and I wanted to have yeah. give you the opportunity to share with our viewers what's going on with you. Yeah, so um, I'm currently writing a, like a really quick book that I intend to publish online that highlights the history of different systems and why we ended up with this massive system the way it is now. Um, and legal is one of one of the systems that I'll be taking into account. And so um, if you want to kind of be in the loop about when that gets published, you can sign up for my newsletter on uh, RitaFiero.com. And uh, the other thing is that I am the president of the Home for Good Coalition that aims to organize people across 12 systems to transform how we, um, how we relate to children. And the guiding question we stand in is, what does a system that reflects the love we have for our children really look like? And we have an online summit coming on June 23rd from 6 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And so to sign up for that, you can go to homeforgoodcoalition.com. That's homeforgoodcoalition.com. And you can um, click on events and you'll see a registration form. You'll be forwarded to the registration form. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for being my guest on the show today. I really appreciate your insights. It's We just scratched the surface and there's just so much more to have a conversation about. Uh, so I hope that I can bring you on again, if you're willing. Absolutely. Thank you, Danica. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us for this week of Custody Matters Live. Um, I know that Father's Day is coming up. I hope, I, I wish you all, I send you love and um, well wishes for having a, a happy Father's Day. Have a good evening. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye, everyone.